Before we begin, we'd just like to take a quick moment to thank the organizers, hosts, coaches, and judges who've been able to make this tournament possible for all of us. On a personal note, I'd also like to thank the wonderful women both on my team and at this entire tournament who make this motion so meaningful. Let's begin. I find it just a little bit odd that I, as a straight, white, western male, get to stand up here and begin this debate on feminism. But it's true that all men should be feminists, and that if men really cared about women's rights, the world would be a better place. The difference is, commercialization doesn't make people care. It monetizes a movement that is at a cost to feminism. So what I'm going to be doing into today's day is rather simple. First, I'm going to be addressing the substantive material for team government. We're going to provide two unique, out, uh, two unique substantive arguments for our side. Firstly, that commercialization is principally inconsistent with feminism. And secondly, that commercialization undermines real political change. What I'm going to do before that, however, is a little bit of framing. Starting off with some definitions. We would tell you that commercialization entails the selling of something for a profit. That profit is key. We'd say that something, for example, like Malal Yousaf, that's selling a book for feminism, but then donating that profit towards feminist charities doesn't count as commercialization. Then, towards the actual definition of feminism, we say that feminism advocates for women on the grounds of political, social, and economic liberation. We believe that this liberation must be based upon general equality for women that is both inclusive and intersectional not just for a few select groups. What does this look like? We say that that is to say that women not are not only advocated for that are white or that are from Western countries while excluding women of color. We say similarly, cis-centered feminism is unethical because it is not a take on intersectional approach to feminism. On the question of regret, we would say that this is to disapprove of the way that something has occurred. On the question of framing now, we'd say this debate happens on two grounds. The first is a question of principle. We question whether or not it is within the lines of feminism's principles itself, and if it's consistent or not. The second, a question of pragmatics. Is it pragmatically beneficial for feminism? The debate has to take place on both grounds. With that, I'm going to move into the substantive material for team government. We begin with the argument that commercialization is principally inconsistent with feminism. What would we say this looks like? We say that feminism seeks to make inequality unacceptable, not equality acceptable. That it's grounded in this principle of equality, and that whenever you commercialize something, you're compromising this principle for a profit. We'd say that you do this by prioritizing quantity over diversity. We'd say that corporations are seeking first and foremost to make a profit, not to further so, feminism. So, what this looks like is they're going to search out for the groups that are the most economically empowered. These groups are Western, white women who come from places of wealth. They're the ones that are actually buying corporations' goods. Thus, commercialized feminism is something that is marketed solely to them, because they're the ones who have the money to actually fulfill what the corporation really wants, which is to buy their goods and services. We would say that they're the biggest consumers of the media and products that corporations are involved with. So, commercialized Firm feminism prevents a version of feminism that is compatible with those who are already economically empowered, men and those wealthy white women. There are things like the $300 diamond encrusted solidarity safety pins that you can purchase. That $300 is something that appeals only to them. There are things like comedians like Amy Schumer, who's standing forward and making racist jokes at the same time as she considers herself the bastion of feminine equality because she does a few things that are and makes some pro feminist jokes. I think these are naturally going to be exclusive. There are things like Mabel Jensen, a judge and public figure in South Africa who claims to be a feminist by simultaneously saying that rape is inherent to black culture. All of these things are examples of where commercialized, popularized feminism compromises upon the very equality which, which is central to the idea of feminism. We say that this is systemically exclusive and that the people who are lost along the way, those from Western or from non-Western countries who are truly just seeking out some version of equality that benefits them, those who are not economically empowered because they have been systemically taken away by the class system, those who are not racially empowered, those who are transgender, all of those are eliminated eliminated outright. Then not, we'd say that these are people who are principally deserving of being included in feminism. I'll take you in a moment. That these are people who feminism seeks to stand for in the first place, but the system of commercialization systemically excludes them. You'd have that allowed.
they tell you that poor women are not included in the, co co in the buying of those products. However, when they buy those products, when the rich people in the Western society buy those products, the feminism as a movement gains traction, which in, in, in then helps all women across the globe, all colors, all walks of life, poor or rich. Sir, not that they have you can keep on going on and pretending that you're gaining traction, but again, if you're only focusing on those people who are already empowered, you're not doing a very good job of it. This is the key. It happens outside of pragmatics, the point at which we abandon the principles that feminism is actually based on. We say, oh, Sir. your equality can come later. We've abandoned the very ideas that feminism stands for. We are inherently unequal when we say that equality comes first for wealthy white women and not for those who deserve it otherwise. Now, the second substantive that we're going to present in today's debate. This is something regarding the commercialization of feminism and how it undermines real political change. We say that it does this in several ways. The first is that it's in symbolic action. We say that women are often not the ones in power. They are an overwhelming minority of the world's leaders and members of parliament. In fact, there are more CEOs named John than there are female CEOs, which shows that those who control these corporations and companies that they stand for are really not women. We'd say that they're typically white and wealthy men who make the decisions. They then point to this commercialization as a palliative for change. We look to examples like Unilever, which says their Dove Real Beauty campaign is a feminist and intersectional stance. This is problematic because at the same time, Unilever stands and sells skin lightening products to women of color, telling them that because they are females of color, they are not beautiful. This undermines the intersectional stance they take, but they pretend that they can do it why? Because they've taken some symbolic action to do so. We think that people point to female leaders like Angela Merkel and Hillary Clinton. And every time we talk about leaders in politics, simply to say that women, oh, have now suddenly created equality, even as they face discrimination on a daily basis. And because of this, people often do nothing because they think that they see the change in society. Secondly, we would tell you that it eliminates political change because it's never going to normalize feminism. We'd say ultimately this is a trend. It's something that only works when it's really unique and can be shared rapidly. But the point at which multiple companies normalize this and advance feminism as they say they're somehow going to do, it's not unique anymore, which means companies are going to stop doing it. Again, because they're not interested in furthering feminism, they're interested in making a profit. Thirdly, we'd say that this is an exclusive feminism which break apart, breaks apart coalitions. This argument is key, because we'd say that political change comes from a lot of people who care a lot about an issue. So there's two issues at play, quantity and quality. We'd say that quantity is decreased because it's systemically exclusive. When a woman who wears a burqa sees feminism and Western feminists say, oh, you're wearing a burqa, you're not a feminist, you've not been empowered, then she leaves it and she doesn't vote along feminist ideals. That takes away the coalition and people aren't voting together. On quality, we'd say that it's really just a feminism that's distilled to a corporate click of a button. It's something that's no longer about the actual intersection between races, genders, and ideals. This is now something that just says, oh, I support a Equality, so I'm a feminist. I have a newsflash for the opposition. Most people support equality. It's when we get into the actual pragmatics of political change, but they disagree. However, the only thing that's really beneficial to these corporations, the corporations that are seeking for profit, is where everybody already agrees. That's the issue of equality. It prevents progress. It prevents political change. So now we stand in proposition. Thank you. Dear audience, dear panel, in a commercialized society in which we live, it is necessary for each movement to be able to make change within the commercial, commercialized society. It's not a debate about whether or not commercialization is regrettable, it's about the pragmatic benefits that commercialization of feminism brings to the debate. We on opposition have two fundamental claims about why we do not regret the commercialization of feminism. Firstly, we say that the compromises that the feminist movement had to make to get there were not too big. And secondly, we say there are concrete benefits that come directly with commercialization of feminism, namely for the women in developing countries and in the first world countries as well. Furthermore, to prove this case, we bring you three arguments to the table. Firstly, about popularization of feminism. Secondly, about the concrete benefits that this brings. And thirdly, about the impact on the women in developing countries. Now, we have to recognize in this debate that we are trying to solve the issues of perception of women in society, attitude towards women, and self-perception. We say legislative change has, in fact, in a majority of cases, been dealt with. And we, of course, agree it's necessary, but the main issue is how to change perception. We say, therefore, it is more important to try and change perception. 
which is why we have to we have to consider the implications about the definition of commercialization of feminism. What proposition doesn't tell in this debate, and I think it's incredibly necessary, is that commercialization of feminism means market feminism. It means creating a personal brand in which you propagate feminism. For example, how Beyonce creates a personal brand with which she propagates feminism, or how Emma Watson created a personal brand. I think this is incredibly important in today's Sir. debate. No, thank you. Now, in my speech, I shall have first the rebuttal and then I'll go on to constructive material. First, about rebuttal. They bring up this first argument about the principal idea of feminism, right? Our first response to that is, we don't care about principle. Dear gentlemen, as long as, let's say, as long as there are concrete benefits, as long as there are more women on corporate boards, as long as there are concrete benefits, we do not care about the principle. Furthermore, we say, we don't know why Emma Watson distributing tampons and spreading feminism in developing countries would be regrettable. We don't care, what, we don't know how this goes against the idea of feminism, no one has to that out of the house. Furthermore, when I talk about the already empowered white women, we say that in Sir. today's, you no know, thank you, commercialized feminism, we reach comparatively more people of color, more women of color than we did before. I mean, look at the discourse that's happening. Right now, there are more inclusive discourses, considering Beyonce, considering all of the black women of all of minorities, and they were comparatively 30 years before. Furthermore, in our first argument, we will show to you how it's better because popularization means more people get the message, and third argument will prove exactly why in developing countries it gets better. Okay, now when you talk about how it undermines political change, two ideas here. First, you talk about the Dove campaign, right? And we say, and this is problematic because it imposes beauty standards. We say, firstly, these beauty standards are a consequence of the pre-existing patriarchal system. What we say is that the situation is improving, the situation is changing, in fact. Perception, no thank you, is changing, and that's what we get with commercialization of feminism. Furthermore, we say that more people getting the message means that the message is more likely to make political change, which is what we support. Sir. No, thank you. And when I talk about identification, right, we say, and this is a direct response with which I will further on elaborate in the first argument, but we will say, firstly, more people getting the message means you're more likely to identify, and secondly, if you don't identify, at least you do not oppose feminism. At least you do not oppose the feminist ideas actively, right? Note how 30 years ago, being a feminist was a slur word, had a negative connotation. Note how today this is not the case. Okay, onto the constructive material. Firstly, about, no, thank you, popularization of feminism. Here we tell you three things. Firstly, about normalization. We say that with commercialization of feminism, feminism becomes less obscure and less isolated. If you keep on seeing t-shirts that read, I am a feminist, you're more likely to perceive feminism as normal and something every day. Right? And an evidence for this is that 30 years ago, being feminist was a slur word for that as a connotation. That is not the case today, specifically because it had become commercial and therefore it has become more normal in society, and which is what we need in today's society if you want to tackle the problems of perception that prevail in current discourse. Secondly, about reaching more people. We say that it is because of commercialization of feminism, it has reached more people, right? More people know about that because simply commercialization means that like Beyonce gets to spread the message to uh, literally across the world, that Emma Watson gets to have her speeches in the UN in developing countries. Secondly, we say, you're more easily identifying with feminism because they identify with the personal brand. With commercialization, you not only identify with feminism per se, rather you identify with the personal brand of the person who gets to perceive and gets to get introduced into the feminism. Problem. No, thank you. For example, Beyonce is the one who makes a personal brand out of herself, and people get to identify with Beyonce. And because she says, I'm a feminist, they say, I'm a feminist as well, which is incredibly beneficial. Sir. No, thank you. And evidence for this is how young women especially identify with Emma Watson and her brand, He for She. As Emma Watson sells the brand, He for She, young women identify with her and thereby identify with feminism. We think that's incredibly beneficial in today's debate. Thirdly, about how more supporters are gained for the movement. We said, you know, firstly, there are numerically more, and secondly, we said there are quantitatively more, in the sense that other interest groups that otherwise wouldn't get the message. We're talking about here women in rural areas and middle-aged white men, right? 30 years ago, no way these groups would be ever feminist because it was just like the sort of tradition that they were engaged with. However, with commercialization, they don't necessarily have to identify with feminism per se, also with the brand, and furthermore, this is something so normalized, you no know, thank you, it's increasingly normal to do so. 
Now, the impact here is, in a moment, that firstly, you let a mass of people who can identify as a feminist, we need that to solve the contemporary goals of feminism, perception of women and attitude towards women, and the clear benefit of solving issues. Furthermore, note that because of commercialism of feminism, the people at least do not disagree, but actively oppose feminist ideas, which is a clear benefit. Yes. If somebody is identifying as a feminist because they believe in Beyonce's brand, but not because they actually believe in feminism, chances are they're not going to vote based on feminism. That's the entirety of our second argument, which you didn't respond to. I've already explained that. I said that first, they're more likely to identify feminism than in your case. No, they don't death of the house. They don't get the commercialization. What do they have? They don't get the widespread message. They have to advocate for some sort of elitist academic movement in which only the really agitated women get to have the feminist ideas heard, right? That's their case that they have to advocate for. We say, secondly, even if women do not identify with feminism per se because of Beyonce, we say actively they are not opposing it, which is a benefit and an improvement of the status quo. Now, on the second argument about some concrete problems. We said the goals of feminism today are mainly to produce, uh, to change perception, right? And I have talked to you a lot about that. Now for some actual data. Dear gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as 30 to 40 percent more of CEO uh, people on board are women, so this is clearly an improvement of the status quo. Furthermore, there are 50 percent more of NGOs like Emma Watson developing countries. It's clearly better with that. Furthermore, there are more micro loans for women developing countries, and the wage gap, although it persists, is lessening through the year. We say this is directly because of the commercialization of feminism. Dear audience, today's debate has to be judged on concrete benefits. We do not care about the principle as long as it doesn't provide concrete benefits. I am very proud of both. As a young white woman coming from the United States, I come from an immense place of privilege, and I cannot speak for what every single woman around the world needs. But I can certainly tell you what we don't need. We don't need a world in which, quote, at least people don't oppose feminism is the baseline upon which we're going to advocate for our rights. We don't need a world in which, quote, these problems were not too big, so we should just continue to go on with the problems that have plagued our society. We don't need a system where people like Emma Watson can, like the opposition, be claimed for actually supporting NGOs in the developing world, which, mind you, were created by those Western women and had nothing to do with the white savior complex that they're trying to tout in this instance. We don't necessarily just need he for she in today's debate. We just need she. That's why we're proposing today's motion. I'm going to do two things in this speech. I'm going to talk about addressing team opposition's case. After that, I'm going to extend upon the ar arguments that we bring you, that Josh tells you. After that, I'm going to deliver our final argument, which is the idea of how commercialization commodifies feminism. But firstly, I'm going to talk to you about what team opposition tells you on their side of the house. But I'm going to address this in first with the idea of the framing. So here's what they say. They essentially say that they don't don't really care about the principle in today's debate. They're strictly going to look at the practical. But insofar as the principle of what feminism ought to be is the baseline upon which we decide whether or not our practical benefits are actually good or bad, we say that it is naive at best to say that they're just going to, quote, not care about the principle in today's debate. Secondly, on this idea of creating a brand for yourself, we say the way in which you create a brand for yourself, given all of the arguments that they make, such as Beyonce, come from the commercial commercialization of this argument, so come from the idea of the selling and the marketing of certain types of goods. Let's make a distinction right now, which they fuse to engage with, and Josh tells you this very clearly. We say there's a key difference between feminism that happens to make money, for example, Malala writing a book, selling it, and then donating those funds back to women in the developing world, versus using feminism as a tool in a capitalist system to make money, which is the, an example, is using the hypersexualization of women's bodies in media to sell products. That's the type of things we're regretting today in this debate. Here's the first argument that they bring you. They say this idea of all of these t-shirts were actually made, and that was a really good thing. Here's a fun fact. Those t-shirts were actually repealed by the people who made them because they found out that the standards that they were actually making them in were women in the developing world were being output in factories and kept under slave conditions to actually make those t-shirts in the first place. Something that, I mind you, is uniquely comes from the capitalist system that we live in and using commercial of feminism to sell these products. Additionally, what they tell you is that we're reaching people. More people know about feminism. They say people right now don't oppose feminism, so let's just 
Call it a day. Let's pack up and go home because right now, 9 out of 10 people will tell you, sure, I believe in equality, but Josh tells you this in his speech and in his POI, that once you actually approach people on the intricacies, on the actual substantive like material about the like, relevance of certain issues right now in the time, people are not going to actually identify with the struggles of, for example, women of color and the interse intersectional aspects because, I'm sorry, the intersectional aspects in our society are not what make money and that's that's not what is actually being spread out to people. Their second argument is probably the funniest argument in my opinion, is this idea of how there's like numerically more people. But this is the exact problem. This is the idea of quantity over quality. Josh doesn't waste three minutes of his speech talking about this for them to simply say, by virtue of the fact that we have more women on boards means that sexism is over. I like It must be great to come from a position where you can say because women are in boards it means sexism is over. What this means is that we can point to the fact that women are on boards, claim that sexism is over, but in the same time, we're not doing things to actually fight the wage inequality. These women are still going to be told to sit down the entirety of the time that they're actually talking on these boards in the first place. We don't live in a post-sexist society like the team opposition would like you to believe, but first, sure. They have to make a choice. Either defy the consumeristic society or accept it as a paradigm within. within we okay, have okay, so here Apparently, you go. They're here, not doing that. Here's, here's the key distinction. This is what I've talked to you about in the first part of my speech. There's a clear, clear distinction between certain feminist causes that happen to make money. So, this is the idea of if I, as a feminist like group of people, like make a product and I like am doing that with the purpose of actually like spreading feminism, so like Malala writing her book. But if I am like some white dude sitting up in like a building somewhere using feminism as just a simply a means to sell my products, we say that's what's principally bad. Let's talk about the prop case. Because we don't get any engagement on the principle in today's debate, which is really important. We say that because corporations are uniquely profit driven, they target their, their the products they make to the people who are going to make them, who are going to put the most amount of money into the society. When we tell you who those people are, it's usually people in positions of privilege, like wealthy white people, like wealthy white women. So what they do is that they target all of their products to those individuals. And you know what happens? We completely forget the intersectional aspects in today's debate. Because you know what? Who are the people that we're trying to stand for in today's debate? It's the women. It's the people who have been systemically excluded from the conversation of feminism for so many years because they don't meet the normalized idea of what being a feminist looks like. These are the people that you're never going to actually see in commercialized wow. media because they're not, because commercialized media, because they're not fitting the normalized image. So this is what we tell you under our second argument, which once again does not get enough contention. We tell you that this is symbolic action in the system right now. The Dove Real Beauty campaign, on one hand, can give you a video in which a bunch of women are being told that you look beautiful, where on the other hand, they're also owned by a company that sells skin lightening products to black women. We're at the point in society right now where women don't need to be told you look beautiful and you live in a patriarchal society. We need to do something about it. And insofar as the commercialization is actually pointing to a clear way that women are actually being exploited for profit, we say that we need to actually take a concrete stance in today's debate. That brings us into the third argument. This is the idea of commercialization commodifies feminism. Here's what we tell you. What is the role of the woman in the capitalist society? We say that capitalism by its nature exploits morally arbitrary factors in order to make profit. So here's an example. We say that if right now women stopped buying beauty products, every single major economy in the entire world would crash immediately because that's how inextricably linked women are with the global economy right now. Look to the example again of things like the tampon tax, which is a sexist tax which our capitalist society allows to be continued to be perpetuated. But if you see at the same time, the company that owns tampons that sell these, the Always Company, also owns Axe, which is a men's company that you know has a lot of very sexist marketing products at the same time. So what do we tell you? The use of capitalism in and of itself is an unjust way and an unjust means by which to attempt to promote feminism insofar as women are actually subjugated by this system. So in a world in which women's bodies are literally sold or literally turned into the to products to be consumed, we say that even if the Dove campaign can show women of a different body type, we say that, so women of a different body type, we say that that actually doesn't do anything to fight the system that actually makes it so that women have to be exploited in the first place to make profit. We say that at the same time with the t-shirt example, while people may be wearing their t-shirt, they don't, uh, they ignore the fact that women around the world are way more likely to be roped into situations of wage slavery and outsourced factories that will actually be 
you know, producing those t-shirts. So what we tell you is that women have no obligation to actually take us to perpetuate a society and a system that profits off their exploitation because we stand for rejecting a system in a world that profits at the exploitation of women's bodies. I am so proud to propose. Dear side proposition, this is not a debate about whether we should abolish capitalism. This is a debate about feminism as a movement inside the capitalistic society that we live in today. And that is what we're debating on our side. On our side, we're debating about the actual concrete effects that it has. We're analyzing what kind of effects it has for all women. And we're claiming that these effects are mainly positive. What does buying a feminist shirt mean for me? It means that feminism as a movement came to me, a 16 year old from Slovenia. What does buying a feminist t-shirt mean for Matthias? It means that he can say, as a boy, that he has a feminist freedom. And what does buying a feminist shirt mean for my grandmother? It means that she can freely wear a shirt that says feminist, despite that being a slur in her times. That are the, those are the effects of feminism, and that is what we stand for on our side. Three things I will be missing. Firstly, I will further respond to their first speech. I want to talk about this principal inconsistency about under undermining real change. Secondly, I will respond to their argument about capitalism. Thirdly, I'll present a third argument about how this is a platform to help women in developing countries. Okay, firstly, about principally, principal inconsistency. The first thing I have to understand is that the society changes through time, and such movement as feminism has to develop as well. It has to adapt to the society in which it lives. This means that feminism has to adapt to certain consumeristic uh, values. And that is what feminism is doing. Why? Because this is the way in which it gains the most supporters. And we believe that that is you know, doing more good than harm to the movement. The second thing that we spoke about is this Western white, white woman. And despite a bit more focus being on the West, we believe that firstly, these women that are now ambitious, that are now successful, are still role models because they can show that, we, uh, that a woman can become su successful just as men. And the second thing is, which I'll be talking about my third argument, is that this actually yeah. still helps the women in third world countries. Why? Because more people know about it and people are there for more inclined to help. But, uh, but more about that later. Ma'am. The third thing is that feminism that we have still has a lot of good messages. We feel it brought it up in our second argument. He spoke about how we are still fighting the role models. Role models. He spoke about how we are gaining self-empowerment for women. He spoke about how the perception of on women is changing. Those are some of the uh, some of the effects feminism has. Because feminism in our society has to be mostly perceptional. Because especially in the West, it's... Good point. Okay. things are not on the legislative level, but they are on the level of perception, and that is what you're striving for today. <laughs> Just keep okay. going. Okay. Okay. Sure. okay, but on the legislative level, we still have women in third world countries, and that is our third argument. Ma'am. Now to the, their second argument, which is about undermining real change, but before I move on. Sure. Wealthy white women can now get rich and have great jobs, but it doesn't mean a lot if you're an African-American woman Sir. who's been systemically discriminated against through processes Sir, of racism. we're repeating all over again that this helps all women. Why? Because more people know about it. People are more inclined to help. They have more people that identify themselves as feminists. We have more people joining feminist movement. We have more people donating. We have more people having different propagandas. That is how we help women of all, of all colors. Second thing, about undermining real change, about their second argument. The thing is, with more people, we have more political capital. We have more people that are more inclined uh, to do something. We still have this collective feminism because we have more people. But we still have, on the other hand, this individualistic feminism that helps a woman's perception of herself. We believe that that is also very important, and that is a result of commercialization of feminism. And at least, as Philip spoke, we do not have many people that are opposing feminism. I mean, sure, a lot, a lot of people are identifying, and we acknowledge that some people do not actually know what feminist is. But we believe that they are at least not opposing feminism and hindrance in its, its development. Now, the, to the fifth thing about their, argu the, about their second argument, about how things are not changing. Because we believe that things are still changing. Philip spoke about how 30 to 40% uh, of women are on corporate boards. And yes, we acknowledge that they are still discriminated against. Yeah. Against, but the thing is, we do not have to advocate for this absolute equality that exists because it does not exist. We simply have, have to advocate for the, for the fact that things are changing. We believe that they do. Now to their third argument, which is about this, uh, which is this capitalism argument. We believe 
the desired proposition is that they doesn't want a world with compromises. We believe that feminism as a movement had to make certain compromises. We believe that they have been yeah. just and they haven't been too big. And the thing is, if they have, if we don't have this kind of movement, what kind of feminism do we have? We do not understand. We do not ask for a counter model here. We're simply asking, what is the alternative? What will it have if not commercialist feminism? And the thing is, again, that this is not a debate whether capitalism is good yeah. or bad, but rather a debate how feminism as, as a movement performs within the society. Okay, now to my third argument, which is about how this, this is a platform to help women in developing so countries. On. Yes. The type of fem feminism we have is the type where we don't see Dove on the one hand telling women they should love themselves, but then behind closed doors actually selling skin lightening products to women of color and Madam. telling them they need to change the way they look. Madam, this is not a debate whether this feminism is perfect. We're simply proving what all the positive effects that there are from this feminism. We're showing that it's still empowering, that it's still helping women. Of course there are problems, but we think that things are going to the better because of this type of feminism. Now, with this argument, we go further, further from the West. We go to all women on a global scale. We will show you how this helps women also uh, from Africa, from developed countries, from Asia, how this helps all women, not only the privileged ones that they spoke about. So the thing is that we have differences for women in the West and in the developing countries. Now, the things for women in the West are quite different because they have to mostly deal with the perception towards them. Meanwhile, for women in the third world countries, they mostly have to deal with legislation. So now that, now, now that, this, uh, that this has been characterized, now let me speak about the political capital uh, that this gains for women of the third world countries. The thing is that more people are informed, right? Like, not only about women on the West, but we have people like Emma Watson, which is campaigning, which has a campaign, he for she. And what she is doing, she has this yeah. brand where she, where she brands um, equality for women everywhere. She has a brand with which she advocates for women in Uganda that have no education. She advocates with women that have no, pro uh, that, that have no proper health care. This is what we want. I mean, if people see that Hermione is fem feminist, we think that it's much more likely yeah. for pe people to join the feminist movement. What this causes is, is, is it is much more likely that firstly, people will donate money to, uh, to these women. Secondly, it is more likely that people will donate to NGOs and they will be more likely to attend these different projects for women. And thirdly, we, still, we have a percentage of money coming from, uh, from feminist products that is still going to women in third world countries, right? We have these certain products that are branding feminism, but what happens is that a certain per percentage of this price is going to women in third world countries. So that is another reason how, reason how we also help women in developing countries, right? But we also have proof for that. We have microloans that went up for about 50% for women in the past uh, in the past 15 years. We have 70% more interest in NGOs in the past 15 years. I mean, especially in NGOs about feminism that are helping women in developing countries. We think that there is much more engagement for people, for, for women in the third world countries, and that is especially because more people know about this problem and more people are there for women trying to help. We're spreading the message to, to the third world countries. Because of all this campaigning, because of all these projects and the NGOs, the message of feminism is also coming to them, but more importantly, it is helping women of the third world countries. So what we have overall is we're helping women on the West, because we're helping the perception on them. We have the perception they have for themselves, we're helping destroy these gender roles that are, that are threatening us. But on the other hand, we're also helping women in the third world countries. Because of commercialized feminism, I feel empowered. And because of commercial feminism, I believe that I have a choice. And I believe that other women have it as well. Thank you. Team opposition's definition of identifying as a feminist is that I can wear a t-shirt that says I am a feminist and for some reason I'm going to engage in political movements, I'm going to engage in change, but sadly we think that their idea of wearing t-shirts to support feminism, we think that's a radically, we basically think that's a naive idea. We don't think it encompasses actual political change and at the point where we tell you that simply put our version of feminism real feminism, feminism that rejects commercialized feminism and that returns to what feminism was before commercialized feminism is better, we're proud to propose today's motion. So first, I'm going to show you why team opposition makes a key strategic error, and then I'm going to go and tell you why on three points of clash, the principle, 
the movement, and women's rights, Team Proposition is winning today's debate. So there's basically one strategic error that Team, Pro team Opposition makes in their second opposition speech, and that's they entirely drop Liz's, th uh, our third substantive argument, about why basically there's a commodification of women. In essence, the only thing they say is that, well, Team Proposition is just ranting about capitalism, and trust me, as much as I know any of us would like to rant about capitalism for eight minutes, that's not what I'm here to do. What Liz points out to you, and it's extremely nuanced analysis that for some reason they seem to miss, what Liz points out to you is she says that the commercialization of feminism and the commodification of women, the exploitation of women, are inextricably linked. Let's examine why that's true. Liz points out that we see that basically commercialized feminism is used to mask the actual problems. When Dove has a real beauty campaign and tells women that they're beautiful, but then it's selling basically light, it's selling lightening products to dark-skinned women, we think that they're using commercialized feminism to mask basically the inherent racism in their other products. No thank you. We think that when H&M basically says they're using feminist advertising campaigns, they're hiding the fact that literally they routinely fire pregnant women and use sweatshirts labor in developing countries. We think that basically their idea of a commercialized feminist movement is one that enables the commodification of women. If I think I'm a feminist because I'm wearing a feminist t-shirt, I'm not able to understand that the people who made that feminist t-shirt are uniquely disadvantaged, disadvantaged because for some reason I felt the need to wear a t-shirt proclaiming myself as a feminist the entire world. Look, the key strategic error and the reason why team opposition and the reason why team opposition loses this argument is because they don't understand that we're not advocating for, basically, we're not telling you that capitalism is inherently evil, we're telling you that the commercialization of feminism enables exploitation. We're telling you that the, commercial of, the commercialization of feminism uniquely enables, basically, the commodification of women. And we're showing you constantly why that's bad, but for some reason, we see no analysis to that. So now let's move on to, basically, the three central points of clash in today's debate. The principle, the movement, and what women's rights looks like. And I'm going to show you why Team Proposition is winning all three points of clash. So first let's go into a principle. They basically tell you in the first opposition that principle isn't important, and then they, for com they basically completely forget about it in their second opposition. That's literally their only response to principle. Okay, <laughs> look, here's why principle is important. Let's look at child labor. Child labor sounds really beneficial on the practical because guess what, it makes people money. But it's absolutely morally abhorrent on the principle. At the point where we tell you that principle arguments are important, we're telling you the reason principle arguments are important is because they're the values that you have to keep a hold of in today's debate. So now let's examine exactly why team proposition is winning this principle Sorry. argument. Sure, I'll take your point in a minute. But first, we think that because opposition basically hasn't provided a principle, we think they're radically behind and we've moved ours down the bench for every single speech. Here's the point. Commercialized feminism is principally bad because it's exclusionary. We show you that commercialized feminism basically means that people of color, that trans women, that low-income people aren't covered in the movement. And here's the problem. Here's what Josh explains to you all the way at the beginning of Proposition 1, something we see no analysis with whatsoever. When feminism rejects its base, when it rejects the idea that feminism is for everyone, that equality is for everyone, they reject the value of equality inherently. And me just tell you that's principally bad, but for some reason you seem to disagree with that idea. The reason why child labor is principally wrong because it is because the stakeholder, the children, have the bad practical effects because they are Okay, are okay, look, child labor is also basically principally wrong because no one wants to exploit children. The same way, like, guess what? No one wants to exploit women. Look, at the point where we tell you that you're exploiting women to basically commercialize them. You're exploiting women to commodify them. We say that's exploitation of women, and we say that's principally wrong. At the point where you don't even provide a principled analysis of today's motion, we think that you're already lacking. But we do think that the principle is important, and we see that, and we basically we've shown you exactly why the principle is so important in today's debate. Let's not reject equality as some form of value, let's hold it as important in today's debate. And the only way you can do that is by a vote for the proposition. But now let's talk about the movement. Basically, what is a stronger movement? Now remember, Josh tells you at the very beginning of Proposition 1, we set a standard for what the feminism movement should look like at the top of our case. We tell you it's an intersectional movement fighting for everyone's liberation. But Team Opposition's idea of a feminist movement is that I can wear a feminist t-shirt and suddenly I become a feminist. 
We think that's absolutely ridiculous because, simply because wearing a feminist t-shirt does not mean I engage in political change. And Liz gives you, Liz gives you this nuanced analysis in Proposition 2 that they absolutely don't respond to. And she points out, at the point where people are literally just wearing t-shirts, saying they're feminist, but they're not actually engaging in an intersectional movement when it comes to it, basically, they don't see the political change that they're advocating for in their entire speech. Look, Liz points out, Women who are basically people who are wearing these feminist t-shirts follow this concept of westernized white feminism, but they don't want to follow an intersectional movement when it comes to that. Here's why that's important. Because Liz explains to you that when you don't follow an intersectional movement, the needs of everyone aren't met. Look, at the point where you're only prioritizing Western white women ahead of literally everyone else, ahead of women and of, ahead of people of color, ahead of trans women, ahead of people in developing countries, we think that they're already behind. We think that this is a weaker movement, and that's why we think proposition is winning on the movement. But now let's move to the biggest argument, the biggest point of clash in the today's debate, which is women's rights. Now they spend their entire, basically their entire third substantive argument is for some reason how basically this white feminism, how Emma Watson is going to help people in Uganda. First of all, we think that's ridiculous. We don't think that Emma Watson should be given credit for basically helping people in Uganda when we think the women of Uganda are the ones helping themselves. We think that they're the ones enabling their own change. That's what Liz tells you. She explains to you that it's basically patronizing to tell women of color that they're the ones who need Emma Watson to save them. We don't think that's true at all. We think that, no thank you, we think that basically the people of Uganda deserve credit for lifting themselves up on their own, but basically more importantly, in response to Liz's POI, this is really important. Their second, pro their second opposition speaker concedes that it's only that basically the feminist movement that they advocate for, commercialized feminism, is only really helpful for a couple people. Even though they say, well, a stronger feminist movement helps everyone. But first of all, Liz points out that it's not a stronger feminist movement. But second of all, Liz points out it's uniquely not helpful for everyone. Here's what we see. We see the Say Her Name campaign, a group of black women who reject commercialized feminism because it doesn't appeal for because it doesn't allow for them. We saw in the 1960s that black feminists walked away from white feminism because they began a process of commercialization, because it didn't account for their needs. At that point, we tell you it's literally not helping the people that team prop team opposition says it will. Look, we see that there's even a socialist people's Par people of color party who reject commercialized feminism because it doesn't help them. At the point where team opposition gets up here and tells you a lot of arguments about basically, you know, there are more women in CEOs and board positions, and every speech Liz has been asking them, you never show the analysis for why people wearing t-shirts means more women in CEO positions. They've never shown you any analysis towards their actual impact. They've never actually proven to you why a commercialized feminist movement is better for the women. But we've shown you it's worse, it's, it's worse for the movement, it's worse for the women, and it's worse on principle. And that's why we're proud to propose today's Motion. Sorry about the delay. I had to dress up because, like, I I felt cold from the amount of strawmanning and mischaracterization that came from the side of the Came from the side of our, our case was wrong, and I shall explain to you why we should oppose this motion and not support not support their argumentation in one, two, three, four points of contention. First of all, about the motion, what this motion should be about, how should we debate it. Second of all, what the nature and the principle of feminism actually is. Third of all, how political change happens or doesn't happen, and finally about the disprivileged women. Let us start with the motion. Now, first of all, <coughs> they have a problem in their case, right? They have a sort of a shift. In the first prop speech, they speak about some sort of harms that are coming from commercialized family, feminism, so on and so forth. And then in the second one, they have a shift. They, they started to, to speak about economic exploitation, how consumerism is bad for women per se. And they have to make a choice here. Because if they want to fight outside of the system of commercialization of the capitalism, they have to explain how are they going to fight that outside of that system, provide some sort of a picture of a world, how does this look like, otherwise we have no idea what's going on on their side of the bench. Sir. So, however, for the majority of this debate, we have stayed within the boundaries of the system that we currently have, consumerism. And the question therefore is, in which, uh, how do we perform best, how do we gain 
the best effects in this system. This is how we negate the third argument as well. Because the third argument and the majority of their case is not full of content, full of analysis, full of anything. They Sir. have three examples. The Dove advertisement, one sweatshop that was exploitative, and based on that, they tell you how the system is corrupt and we need to change the system. They never provide any in-depth analysis. They never explain to you how the things are going to be different in their side of the house. Second of all, we, we think that they are themselves are conceding when they tell you that Malala selling a book and then yes, using sir. that profit, uh, using that profit for NGOs is a bad thing because a lot of feminism brands, a lot of commercialized feminism is actually about the fact that you are selling something and then a part of that profit goes sir. to support NGOs, which was a part of our debate from the very start. So debating the motions, they have a problem of consistency and deciding what actually they do want to debate. But okay, let's go forward. Let's go to the nature of feminism. The second thing, uh, the second point of my speech, they are all about the principles in this case, in this speech, in, in the whole of their benches. They, we have to realize something. What is the point of feminism? The point of feminism, the ladies and gentlemen, has changed throughout the years. First, there was a suffrage movement to fight for voting rights. That was the first fight for, for legislative change. And now, as we explained many times, we are in third way of feminism, where we are fighting for change of societal perceptions and things like that. Which means that there is no real, unified, homogeneous principle of feminism as such that we fought for uh, in, through entire history. We fought for to reach equality. We fought, fought for practical effects. And when they tell, talk about exploiting children, child labor, the biggest problem with child labor is that the practical effects for children are bad because exploiting Sir. is bad for the children, which is why we oppose that. Same goes for feminism. We oppose, we, 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 fem, point of feminism is to achieve goals, to achieve something, the, 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 the world to become a better place for women. So for us, a principle Sir. of feminism does not matter if we actually create a better world for women. But they seem to disagree. When women are actually exploited through sexist marketing, through seeing their bodies put on display for sale, allow me to tell you that that's actually caused a t intangible harm to them, analogously to children being impacted in this situation. We do a comparative. On one hand, we bring you the benefits of consumeristic feminism. On the other hand, they still cannot explain whether this is a result of the capitalism system that we have, or, or, or how are they going to solve that on their side of the house, how that's going to be better. So this question is irrelevant and does not matter. Third point that I'm going to speak about is the point about political change. And here they bring about very little positive matter. They basically have one giant point which, which tries to tell you that there is no normal Normalization going to happen, that it's all just going to be symbolic. And here we tell you that we clash this point. We clash this point with our argumentation, namely with our first and second argument. Let me remind you of what those points were. First of all, we explain to you that commercialized feminism means that people who otherwise would not get in touch with feminism get in touch with Sir. feminism. How does a small girl who is not a debater get in touch with feminism if there's no commercialized feminism? Sir. How does a sexist old male get in touch with feminism if there is no such thing. We explain to you how there is bigger outreach when you have that and they have not negated that point. Sir. Second of all, we explain to you that through that mechanism people get acquainted and normalized with feminism. Because 15 years ago, feminism was a dirty word. Calling someone feminist and identifying as a feminist was something obscure, something alternative, something wrong. Today that's different because feminism <coughs> has been a part of our culture for such a long time that the, the term itself has become more normal for, pe for people, which means that people who educate themselves, get normalized with that, are more likely to become feminists, or on the other hand, are less likely to oppose feminism. And when the arrogant second speaker says, oh, but those benefits are so small, they are not going to oppose it. Yes, of course, that's the point. Currently, in their side of the house, they do oppose uh, changes of, le uh, of legislation. In Turkey, we had a very sexist law against uh, um, uh, 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 going against women. That would not have happened in a world where majority of the population associates and identifies as feminism. So when they tell you that so our benefits are minimal, when they tell you that our benefits are marginal, we ask them, what are the benefits that they bring on their side of the house? How is the world better on their side of the house? They, just minimizing our benefits is not going to do much. Because what happened here is that besides the principal point of how it's bad, they had three examples of a sweatshop, of an advertisement, of something like that. We explain to you how through perception of the society that gets changed, we explain Sir? to you how through self-perception and role models, real change happens. We, ex we, we gave you the facts. We gave you the, we gave you the 30 to 40% more women on board. We gave you the fact that black girls can associate with Beyonce now, which is 
huge empowering for them. And yeah, they are the majority, uh, the, the, the minority in their, um, uh, 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 that they want to protect in their case. We explain that feminism is not an ugly word anymore. We bring tangible benefits on our side of the house. They bring none, which is why the point about political change goes to our side of the house. Sorry. They provide no benefits, we provide the benefits. And the final point that I want to speak about is the point about third world countries, about the disprivileged women. They, what they did was that they explained to you over and over again why in principle it is bad that we have commercialized feminism, that it is bad that it only works for white women. They never explained in depth why is that relevant, why does that matter, because we provide the argumentation in which we tell you that because of commercialized feminism there is more action going on. The only negation they have to our third argument was the negation where they claim that Emma Watson helping people in Nigeria or Uganda is morally abhorrent. We explained to you that if because of commercial feminism, you have 50% raise in, uh, fund, in funds for NGOs that work in those countries. If you have uh, uh, feminism normalized in those countries, if you are able to spread the idea of feminism, feminism to those countries, then you are helping women in those countries. And no matter what principle they bring to you, we are proving that there are tangible, uh, tangible benefits on our side of the house. And we wonder what benefits we would get on their side of the house. Because on their side of the house, we would not get those benefits, but yet yeah, we would be principally all right, principally in order. In our case, we explain to you how we get tangible positive effects on our side of the house. We explain to you why they have to decide why which system and why they want to fight and that they have to show to us what exactly does the world look on their side of the house. Because of all those reasons, we are very proud to oppose and beg It is quite entertaining debate we had this side opposition, which delivered mostly good benefits that the families have, right? But the same proposition, we have a side that is comparing child labor to commercial feminism, which we believe is quite absurd. What is more important? Is it more important that we show princip principally what, which side wins, or is it more important that we show the actual effects? We, re we believe that it is much more important that we show what happens to women all around the globe with commercial and feminism. We believe that the principle level is simply not enough, and that is what the side proposition is doing. There will be two clashes I will analyze in this last reply speech. Firstly, I would like to talk about the people actually engaged, because this was a clash in this debate, whether commercialized feminism actually has any concrete effect. Secondly, I would like to talk about these values of commercialized feminism. What kind of feminism do we have today and why this is still very much important? Okay, first clash. The people actually engaged. The thing that we spoke about all over and all over again is that we have a bigger outreach, right? I mean, that's quite clear. More people know about it. But we have also proven why this is so important. We have our first argument that spoke about how we normalize feminism. We spoke about how 20, 30, 50 years ago, a feminist was a bad word. We spoke about how today it is not any more weird if a person says, I'm a feminist, and nobody has anything bad to say about it. That is why I believe that this commercialization has been so important. The thing is that it is all over the place. Feminism is everywhere. I mean, Beyonce has songs about it. We believe that this is so much in the pop culture that people know about it more and more. And this especially because they associate their role models, which are today in the pop cultures, they associate them with feminism. Therefore, we believe that they're even more inclined to research a bit about feminism, to look into it. I mean, my role model is a feminist, therefore I believe that people are more likely to look into what feminism actually is. And the main point is that even if it's not 100% effective, even if it doesn't have 100% results, we believe that this is still better than what the side proposition is doing. Because what they're doing is they're attacking our, our case. What they're doing is they're presenting no alternative. They're simply saying that it's not good enough. And they're saying that it would be better if we had feminism as it was in the time before commercialization. We say that that is not okay. We say that feminism then was not sufficient. It did not help enough women. It was specific to that society, and this feminism is specific to our society. There we believe, because they show no alternative, we believe that this point also, also goes to our side. Now the second question, which is about the values of commercialization and this principle level, because we would also like debate on their side. The thing is, what we explain is that it also has some, uh, some uh, perceptional values that it has. We explain how this contributes to the empowerment of women. We explain how Beyonce says that we wake up flawless. We ex explain how we're tackling gender roles. We explain how there has never been so much dis discourse about rape, about women of color, about Hispanic women. Of course there are still problems, but the thing is that there is more discourse than ever, and that is exactly because of commercialization of feminism. In the beginning of our case, we have put two premises. 
Firstly, that in a consumerist society, a movement such as feminism, such as a feminist movement, has to adapt to society. We believe that that has been quite a necessary thing. And that brings me exactly to my second premise, which is that the compromises that feminism has made have not been too, too big. We understand that it's not perfect, but we are aware of the all positive consequences it has in our society. Because of commercialized feminism, firstly, we don't have more choice. They can choose either they have kids, either will they have career. We believe that because of commercialized feminism, it is okay either way. Because women have a choice and they're okay with, uh, with every choice. Second thing is that women feel much more empowered than they do on their side. Women do not compete each other anymore. Women are not the ones that are equal to men. Women are now the ones that are capable of anything. And that is the result of commercial femi feminism. The commercialized feminism is dealing with the perception, and that is exactly what we, we need today. The movement had to adapt to the society it lives in today, and therefore we propose this motion. Oppose, sorry, well, this motion. Thank you. If team opposition wants to talk about perception in today's debate, we tell you that the perception of women is not improved when, when they see themselves in media, they see naked videos telling them that that's how it has to be if you want to be pretty, or that's how it has to be to sell products. The perception is not improved similarly if young girls, for example, we see, are forced into a society from a young age that tries to sell them products to straighten their natural hair, to lighten their naturally dark skin, but at the same time turn around and say, oh, we're a feminist company. And the perception of women is certainly also not improved by calling them arrogant. So here's what I'm going to do in this speech. I'm going to ask two questions. First, I'm going to address today's debate on the principles, secondly, the practical. But first, one key error on behalf of team opposition. Here's what they tell you. They say that, oh, because team proposition doesn't simply present this like magical alternative world, that means that they lose. No, what we tell you is we regret, we, we think a world is preferable, we regret commercialized feminism insofar as it produces a world in which people use feminism as a pocket-sized way to actually promote and make profit. That's the type of situations that we're regretting. That has been abundantly clear from Josh to Aditya in today's speech. I don't know why that was such a big problem for him in his last speech. Let's talk about the principle, because we get some contradictory analysis regarding it. We go from literally, quote, we don't care, to by the end getting about a couple minutes on it. What we tell you very simply is that if the principle of feminism, as we define it, and has gone uncontested, is to have an intersectional approach towards women's liberation, one that encompasses the crossover between race, gender, and sexual orientation, insofar as the commercialization of feminism undermines that principle, that is a reason to regret it in today's debate. Not enough analysis analysis and engagement. Aditya very much clearly tells you that when we commercialize feminism, we make it exclusionary, we make it elitist because it only seeks to target things that are going to make it the most money and those people who have time and time again proven to be in positions to make it money are those in positions of power, those are wealthy white people. So let's talk about the practical in today's debate because we believe we're ahead on this too for a couple of reasons. The only thing they say in terms of practical benefits is, oh, more people are feminists in today's world, but we tell you the clear, clear distinction is not simply saying more people are feminist, is not simply saying, oh, I think women and men should be equal. We say feminism ought to promote people thinking that women are free to create liberation and, create, and, are, and are free to actualize themselves in a world free of violence, in a world free of being held to the standards of men. What we tell you is that things that they say when things are simply getting better, we say the point that they can point to Beyonce as being the one example of a powerful black woman and say, wait, well I guess young black women in the world are satisfied now because Beyonce is here. We say that that's not good. But then the second speaker tells you, well, we she concedes. Well, even if we're only going to help white women, that's a good thing because you know she tells you people of color, women of color need to follow in the footsteps of white women to liberate themselves. That's not something we're going to stand for today. Here's what we tell you. If you want to talk about political change, and this is something Josh says, tell me how a Muslim woman who actually looks to commercialized feminism, which demonizes her for her religion and demonizes her for the way that she wants to address, how is she going to feel empowered by that to actually go out and vote for normalized white mainstream feminist parties? We tell you right now, 
the people are rejecting against this. We say, look to the example of the Say Her Name campaign, which is a group of black feminists who are rejecting this normalized, commercialized version of feminism that the white, homogenous, and uh, homogenous voice is perpetuating out on society right now. Look to the 1960s. This is what Aditya tells you when we saw the origin of womanism. This was black women coming together and saying, we are tired of our voices being shut out by people who have been dominating this narrative for so long. Simply because I can stand here today in a debate and have the opportunity to speak about women does not mean that we should just stop and say that feminism has been achieved. For all these reasons, I have never been so proud to propose. Thank you very much.